Welcome to The Extra Dimension. This episode is on the topic of how can you support yourself as a creator, featuring Ian R. Buck, Ian Decker, and Ryan Rampersad. Find the show notes for this episode of The Extra Dimension at thenexus.tv slash TED8. So the internet kind of turned everything upside down within the last 20 years or so. Pretty much our lifetimes, right? Mm-hmm. We're all young young adults here young bucks <laughs> I, I do some enjoy, of us more than others yeah i do enjoy being called young buck uh That's a rapper name so the part of the hope of the internet the, the promise of it was making distribution easy fast cheap essentially a non-existent variable that you that you don't have to worry about right mm-hmm and so part of uh, kind of going beyond that is also the hope that creators can instantaneously, as soon as they've made a thing, put it out there, have people see it, and get paid, mm-hmm. right? Be- yes. Because we want our creators to be able to make a living at what they're doing that maximizes the amount of things that they can do, the amount of quality that they can put in it, because they don't have to go and worry about all of the, the overhead and everything. Yeah. Innovation. Hallelujah. Exactly. Yeah. And so so it's it's a great tool, but it's as we're going to see over the course of this episode, it's not exactly perfect. It it doesn't bring everything all the way to zero. Oh, definitely not. Yeah, no. Um so there are a few links in the show notes that uh go to articles that, that are kind of important for you to understand some some key concepts before we get into talking about um, the broader topic and and we'll we'll summarize them here but i really i encourage everybody who's listening to go and read the articles mm-hmm. uh, as well because they're they're really really good and really really thought provoking yes um, especially the two from kk.org because those those form a lot of the basis for not like they're not medium specific mm-hmm. right and i mean and then afterwards i'm going to talk about specifically having grown up as a musician mm-hmm. um sort of some of my experiences as what can you do to help get yourself out there in both on the internet which is what you're talking about for the first couple of parts but also mm-hmm. with some more physical type art um would that be painting or sculpture or 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 well things that are I guess a little bit more art as opposed to where you are talking about things that are creative. Cause as I had mentioned on the fringe, um, all, all art is creation, but not all creation is art. Yeah. And I hope that most of the things that we'll be talking about here can be considered art in one form or another. Yeah. And I mean, well, yeah, otherwise it's innovation, which mm-hmm. is still cool. And sometimes it can be arts innovation. So why not both? Yeah. And then we'll also wrap up with kind of how these, lessons apply to us here at the nexus because obviously we are creating things here we're recording a a podcast right now and sometime in the future there will be people listening to it i hope and uh so so that's you know we're obviously being distributed over the internet so we'll talk about how how this this concept how these things affect us Mm -hmm. and uh ryan's here to provide the voice of cynicism yeah (laughs) i'm i'm the negative nancy around here (laughs) So I, I will provide a lot of that later, whenever you need it. Awesome. I will, I'll, I'll call upon you. Thanks. The devil's advocate. It's Satine. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, for, first article, um, Better Than Free, is it deals with the, the fact that copies of, of most of the, the works that are distributed over the internet, um, copies are... are abundant, free, and essentially worthless, right? Mm-hmm. Even if you are trying to sell a thing in with digital rights management, you know, you're trying to uh, charge money for it or whatever, you're trying to control how people receive it and consume it and everything, they're going to find a way around that no matter what. Um, and so that that's kind of a useless gesture. And so you have to find things, find ways to sell things that aren't copyable, that aren't... Distri- you, they're they're less tangible, but uh, they're still very very important, and and they're mm-hmm. um, a really big way that creators can can make money. Um, so the the concepts the these nebulous things that they talk about in the article um, include immediacy, so you can sell early access, mm-hmm. um, personalization, making the product unique for a customer, 
I think it's also worth noting that with personalization, you can also make it not only for the customer, but also for yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, and I mean, I'll I'll talk a little bit about that versus cut or making things for the customer versus making things for yourself. But yeah, so personalization. So keep in mind who you're making it for. Yeah. Vlogs would be a really good example of something that people typically start making for themselves, but then, uh, since they are putting them out there for anybody to see if enough people discover it and and find that they like this the personality that's behind these vlogs, then they will accrue a, a following and possibly be able to do something with that. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, uh, personalization when you when you are making something for a specific customer uh, in in a way that is that that only that customer like wants the thing, that takes a lot more effort mm-hmm. than most of these other concepts. So that that one is only useful in very specific cases, I think. Well, yeah. I mean, it, it requires more work, but I I would hope that a good artist would see it then as a challenge to overcome as mm. opposed to restrictions to their individuality. Right, right. Because and- it's it's the ways when you when you apply different ways that you – when you apply different molds to things that you're trying to fit into there. Mm-hmm. Um, they end up breaking the mold in different ways than you might think. So you, if you have rules that constrict you in one way, it'll force you to stretch in other ways, which can lead to some other really cool discoveries and yep. creations as well. Yep, yep. Um, and, it, and it can be as simple as something like uh, taking a poll to see what topic your audience wants the next episode to be on. Mm-hmm. That, would, that would count as personalization um, and, a, and a type of personalization that doesn't take a whole, whole lot of extra effort. Yeah. Um, interpretation. So... The software is free, but the manual is ten thousand dollars. Do you do you like that uh, I, phrase? I, I do like that, and they don't just mean the manual; they also mean support. Mm-hmm. Any yeah. form of non thing, non product that you get as a as an aside, mm-hmm. and uh, that's a great great way to do it. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, authenticity, knowing that the work came from the specific creator that you think that it comes from, uh, so knowing that it's not counterfeit. Mm-hmm. Accessibility. Uh, so this would be like, it, it's really, really nice when you buy music to be able to download the MP3s of them and keep them f- on your own, back them up the way that you want them to. Um, you could also take them and mix them if you wanted to have your own creation to listen to, you know, but the, for most people, it's like, I don't want to have to keep track of those files. I just want to have them in some library with all of the rest of my music that I listen to. So you're probably going to take those and stick them into some media keeper tracker of the program. There you yeah. go. Manager. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Question for you. And I think that this is an important question and we can go back and talk about them all. How do you achieve each of these different points? So like how, what are some different ways that you could achieve immediacy? What are some different ways that you could achieve personalization and interpretation and then so on and so forth? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you want me? Do you want to go back and yeah? Let's do go back and talk about those. Do we want to start over and pretend like we didn't read no, them already? No. Let's just go. <laughs> All right. So yeah. So immediacy, um, early access. This would actually be one that a lot of times um, Patreons mm-hmm. uh, support that kind of thing. Where uh, if you support us at a certain level, then you will get the the videos five days in advance from the uh, mm-hmm. the general public. Um, for games, we a lot of times have betas and early access things where mm-hmm. people can go in and play the thing, uh, play the game, and give feedback before it's finished so that they can help shape the development of it. Which adds a little bit of personalization in there as well. That is true, yes. So that's a, that's a twofer. Mm-hmm. And of course, that could apply, that immediacy could apply to non-internet, non-digital things too. So if you were mm-hmm. making a painting or a sculpture, you could supply pictures or you know models or whatever during that construction mm-hmm. behind the scenes right. stuff mm-hmm. yeah yeah um personalization i'm other than what i already said i don't really i can't think of very many ways to personalize something yeah um yeah interpretation you know that's really hard to do uh well because it is so complex to make documentation to make support usable before your project is done and has existed for a really long time, you don't know what you made until well after you've made it mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. quite often. Yeah. So it's difficult to get there soon, but you can do it once you're an expert at whatever you've done. Yeah. Well, experience is important. Mm-hmm. I mean, part of that's also with the personalization thing. So like coming from an artist's standpoint, if you're trying to make it with a specific goal in mind, 
that's part of personalization, but that's also part of interpretation is how do you want it to be interpreted? I guess is a question that you need to ask. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I'll talk talk about this with more with music later on. Uh, Authenticity is actually a really, really hard one to know for sure, to convey for sure in a digital world, because you can just go in and change the metadata for something. Um, Right. Uh, There's, there's a lot you can do there though. Uh, You know, when I talk about a story on a podcast from the verge, everybody knows it's coming from the verge. Yeah. Uh, but if I am talking about the war game, everybody knows that I'm the one who's doing it because I made that too. So topics that you know about are probably more inclined to be authentic than things you're just reading from somewhere else, just discussing mm. from somewhere else. Mm. So there's there's a, there's certain ways you can get there. And I think this this does have to do with like the, buying like buying a music track from a musician's direct website versus going and torrenting it you know that you Mm -hmm. you don't know where the torrent is coming from who's handled it how it's has it changed was it the original when it was first uploaded you know uh all you you have no idea um whereas if you're buying it from a a source that you trust then you're going to be reasonably assured that it's authentic maybe Is is it actually an apple or is it actually a cheap knockoff yeah maybe you'll is, it, be... is it a stove no not a stove a grill yeah right maybe you'll be certain if you buy it from an authoritative source but maybe not you know those authoritative sources you know if you buy a, a, in the old days a track from itunes it would have been a lossy compressed mp3 certainly mm. not the authentic version of that track oh i see what you're saying right so that just depends mm-hmm. like you can think about it authentic as the best preserved true to its form or authentic, like it's from the actual source from the creator. And that's one thing that I think Bandcamp really does well is when you buy something, you you know that it was like the artist who set up that Bandcamp mm-hmm. store. And when when you're downloading it, you have the option of either downloading a FLAC, so lossless, no, well, minimal compression, right. versus an MP3 or some other crappy format. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Hey. Have fun listening to this podcast in MP3 format. Everybody. Don't worry. It's variable bit rate. You won't notice. <laughs> um, yeah, accessibility. Um, that's a really, really big one in today's age when we have all of these streaming services mm-hmm. that will take your money in exchange for you not having to worry about anything. Right? Yeah. I, I just go, oh, I want to listen to such and such a, a song. Uh, I've never listened to it before. I've never bought it, but hey, I'll search it up. Boom, boom, boom. There we go. I'm listening to it now. I didn't have to, you know, worry about if I had it on my hard drive right now. I didn't have to worry about um, keeping track of it. I, it's it's searchable. It's easy to to manage. So the flip side of accessibility is the signal to noise ratio. So because everybody benefits from the internet's accessibility, everybody also is disadvantaged with all the extra noise you have to get around now Mm -hmm. you have to keep that in mind yep yeah discoverability is something that uh creators live and breathe by well live and die by really yeah yeah and i mean part of that and and again i'll talk about this a little bit more later is networking Mm -hmm. networking 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 is going to be huge because if you're networking with people who are well if you're networking with people then people those people who you're networking with are more likely already inclined to the sort of thing that you're creating Mm -hmm. already inclined to be a consumer for it and therefore probably also know other people yep um and even if they're not going to directly be a consumer of your stuff maybe they will reference you along the way to somebody else yeah who will yeah hey it's almost like that's what social media was based around is it no kind of so embodiment, um, this is where, yeah, digital works can take many, many forms and they depend heavily on the device that they are consumed on. So, uh, comiXology actually does a really, really good job of embodiment for different types of, of devices where if I, if I buy a, a comic book from them, I could read it on my giant 27 inch monitor and have the full two-page spread exactly the way that you'd see it on paper. Or I could get all the way down to my phone where I'm reading it panel by panel. Um, and and it's, it's not exactly the same reading experience because I'm constrained by the 
uh, by the device that I'm on, but it's still technically the same content, right? Yeah. Uh, and then also live versus digital, digitally distributed things is a huge, huge difference. That's oh, yes. the one that most people are going to think of in terms of embodiment. Yeah. And I mean, there is a huge difference because let's face it, we can't, we still can't catch the exact same sound as to what it sounds like live as versus what it sounds like mm-hmm. um, if it's recorded. And there's a bunch of things that have to do with that. And I mean, this is sort of why audio files are, are a thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, but a lot of it actually isn't necessarily just what's with being produced um, in terms of art, but also in terms of the energy in the room, mm-hmm. if it's a live thing. Because if you see it being created live, then you have sort of the excitement that I'm assuming would be there. Something could go wrong. Something could go wrong. Mm-hmm. Or like when we're going to talk a little bit later with the with the thousand true fans, if you have like a concert and you have a handful of people there, they're obviously going to be more excited, which means they'll have more fun, which will change the atmosphere of what's being done. So there's there's the actual product itself, and then there's also the atmosphere of the presentation of the product. Yeah, because nothing is consumed in a vacuum. Mm-hmm. We can't breathe in vacuums. No. But yeah, this also applies not just to musicians, but to everyone else. You know, authors have book signings and, you know, go and listen to them read passages from the book. You've got all actors and everything who go to conventions and you get to go and meet them. And art galleries, art festivals, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all sorts of things. Most definitely. Uh, Patronage. Uh, So this is this is the big one that I'm interested in talking about uh, today. And so this is the concept of the consumer voluntarily giving money to the creator for what reason? Why would they do that? Well, it's it's to ensure, to help ensure that the creator that you like has the ability going forward, the financial ability specifically, to continue making things. Mm-hmm. And also it, it gives the the consumer uh, a sense of ownership over, over the product. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so it's 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 a different sort of patronage now than we would have seen traditionally back in the 1500s when the uh, when the Medici's were pa- patrons of the arts of you know all of these painters and everything uh, because that's that's one person being a patron for the artist whereas now we typically have more distributed uh, many many people contributing are, small amounts to be patrons collective patronization versus singular patronization yep um, and I mean. The overall effect, though, is still the same because when they did that, when they had those patrons of arts, they did that as a show of status, a show of mm. ownership over what's being presented and creating, saying, hey, this is part of mine, too, because I helped create this financially. So now it's just a lot of more people are are banding together to to get that status sort of as an overall thing as opposed to just one person. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Ryan, you look like you were going to say something. I, I just think that you know patronage is so... So dangerous. Yeah? Because now you have to rely on not just yourself to make whatever you're making, but you have to rely on everybody else to actually like whatever you're making in a big enough number to make it sustainable. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's really difficult. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's not the only thing that you... That's true. I mean, uh, among all of these things, you're trying to strive for all of them, but it is such a fancy thing and popular thing now versus you know 20 years ago or longer ago that you probably would have seen it less. It's mm-hmm. just so easy to patron somebody now. Yes. And yeah. that's that's also due specifically to the internet with the the ability of mass information being able to be exchanged. So because you have that many more people who are able to communicate easily because of the internet, it's definitely a thing now. And the, that ease of patronage is a, a crucial part of having the system work mm-hmm. properly, right? Mm-hmm. I am not going to go and support Robert Brockway for the short stories that he writes if I can't just click, like, two buttons and make it happen. I'm not going to go to the effort. Mm -hmm. It's too much. Uh, And finally, findability. This is the big one. This is a really difficult one to do well because, as we said, when the Internet enables everybody to make and distribute their works very, very quickly, very, very easily, very, very cheaply, Man, we've got lots of people online who are who are putting stuff out there. And how do you get found mm-hmm. through all the noise? How do you become the signal in the 
signal to noise ratio. It is very difficult to get there. And not only if you actually are found in that signal, are you the right signal somebody's looking for? Yeah. yeah. It's even worse. That's part of the, the concept of the long tail, uh, which is where we have lots of niche audiences and lots of niche creators, and somehow they've got to find each other. The right niches have to discover each other, and I'm making a, a complicated web with my fingers that are kind <laughs> of intermingling here. And it's, kind of. It's, it's a mess, right? <laughs> which is reflective of the reality of findability. Right. Yeah. yeah. And this, this is uh, why publishers aren't going to die out anytime soon you mm-hmm. you might think that well i don't need to go and sign on with a label in order to get my music out there but you've got you kind of have to in order for the masses to have heard about you mm-hmm. it's very very difficult you have to be either jonathan colton or paul and storm to, in order for for your music to really reach the audience that that it is intended for yeah without the use of the traditional uh publishing system Mm -hmm. definitely yeah and i mean again that's that has to do more with the networking thing publishers have a huge networking thing and it's also sort of that name brand thing where oh it was published by this person you know they must be good so like dark horse comics Hmm. generally tends to have good things so you know if they are published by dark horse it's probably going to be and even if the consumer doesn't directly see that it was published by dark horse they're going to see it prominently displayed in the storefront Yes. Because Dark Horse has that relationship with the storefront. Yes. Yeah. So you just tap into someone who has a large, larger network. So that's why those, yep. those work. So speaking of that long tail, uh, the second, second article here from KK.org, the Technium, whatever they want to call this blog, uh, it has to do with how we can deal with this long tail successfully. So... There are basically two ways that he says that that artists, that creators can be successful financially with a long tail situation. And that is one, having a breakout hit. So one you, hit wonder. Yeah, you're going to be the one hit wonder band from the 80s that everybody's heard of your song, but they can't remember your name. <laughs> Still happens. Yeah. Or uh, you are going to need to accrue a thousand true fans. And the the phrase true fans is it, it, you could call them true fans or you could call them diehard fans or you could you know, whatever. The the gist of it is that these true fans are the ones who are going to be buying basically everything that you make. They're they're going to be traveling long distances to see you live. They're going to be doing everything they can. They're they're going to be interacting with you on Twitter directly. They're going to be sharing your stuff with all their friends, spreading you around. Um, and he. In the in the article, he's got some math that that supports like his reasoning for the number one thousand, and I think it has to do with uh, basically that that these people are going to be willing to spend uh, approximately a hundred dollars on your stuff in a year, mm. and then you multiply that out to get to like a hundred thousand dollars of revenue minus your expenses as a creator. Hopefully, you still have a, a living wage. Hopefully, yeah, from that. And I think that he's assuming that we're living in an area where the cost of living is a heck of a lot more than in Minnesota. Maybe. Uh, although I, I think it's um, just an idealistic that kind of thing. Sure. Like, yeah. uh, you know, this is like the, the ceiling, uh, the average ceiling. Mm-hmm. When it After this, it's too hard to get more. Yeah. But below this, it might not be enough. This yeah. is the ideal. Yes. And the numbers can probably be fudged around a little bit. Like maybe you're not coming out with one hundred dollars exactly worth right. of stuff in a year, but you know, okay. I mean, it's it's difficult to come out with. That would be the equivalent of like eight, seven or eight albums in a year mm, mm-hmm. for for a musical artist. Well, yeah, and then you put on top of that touring, yes. I assume, or other merchandise, like whatever it might be. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, and we'll we'll talk about different different methods of of making money in different mediums and mm-hmm. we'll we'll see a lot of kind of common themes um but so so that's that's kind of the the goal that you're looking for is is getting a thousand true fans um and then the last two articles that we have linked here is a couple of actual creators kind of their their thoughts on this uh whether you know the thousand true fans is is feasible or not um and then uh is talking specifically about the advertising rep, the the advertising model versus the patronage model, right? Um, 
And in, in Hank Green's case, he has found a lot of success with the just asking model of patronage. Uh, and, and I really like the fact that, that he's pushing for that, for people to try it out. Uh, because it's, it's, it's socialism, and I love it. <laughs> and that works really well when people actually like you. Yes. That doesn't work as well. And advertising works better in the cases where people like it, but not quite as much. Mm-hmm. 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 And yeah, so so the thing about the just ask model about patronage is that it really encourages the creators to accrue a following of people who are going to be engaged with the content and who are really going to care. And I and I think that that is a, a, a desirable thing for us to encourage from creators, right? Mm-hmm. We want to be making content for specifically here at the at the Nexus. We want to be making content for people who care about what we're talking about and who are going to be willing to put in the effort to help us to make more stuff. That's it's what funny I'm Funny how we haven't found those people yet. Well, I don't think we've really found many people other than the people that we know yet. Yeah. Well, because right. because we haven't done very much in the in the realm of findability. So we will have to work on that. We a also lot. haven't necessarily had the highest quality of shows. <laughs> That's what we're working on right now. Yes, yeah. sir. Yep. Um so let's let's compare some of the traditional methods of making money versus the the newer methods of making money. Uh so for for a lot of mediums back in the day. So I'm basically doing before the internet and after the internet right. here, right? <laughs> That's the only way that I can conceive of the world as, as somebody who was born in 1992. So for most of these mediums, the, the copy was the, the sacred piece, mm-hmm. right? You were selling a copy of this thing. And it was, it was relatively difficult for people, the consumers, to make copies of their copy and so copyright law was something that was followed through necessity because Mm -hmm. there wasn't the technological ability to just willy-nilly make copies and share them around right yeah and i mean this is also going on like the the things that were distributable where it was multiple things that's not really the best way of putting it but like think musician versus sculptor Mm mm-hmm Whereas the sculptor, you are selling original works. You can't really sell copies of that. Whereas no. with the musician, you are selling copies of a performance. Yeah, unless you team up with a photographer or a 3D modeler or something like that and sell the 3D model of the sculpture or pictures of the sculpture or something like that. In which case, you're selling more data Yeah. than necessarily the art itself. Yeah, that, that's the thing about the internet is you can only distribute things. You can only sell things through the internet that can be digitized, that can be made into data. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is a really obvious thing to say, but it's very profound. It's really, really important for this discussion. Yes. Um, So there, there are exceptions to this um, and most of them have to do with the existence of advertising. Right. So, so if you were writing, um, you know, if you're writing like a really long thing, like a novel or some, some other book like a textbook or you know whatever you're going to be selling a copy of that um if you are making uh something that's a little bit shorter like a, a newspaper or a magazine that has kind of an ongoing um week to week month to month you're going to have kind of double incomes right you're going to have the subscription from people actually buying it but that's going to be supplemented by all of the advertisements that you put into the content as well mm-hmm. um movies are basically pure selling, right, Mm -hmm. of of the copies um, of, well, in the case of the theater, uh, of the experience of going and seeing the movie, and you don't get to see it again until you pay more money. Um, But with, like, television shows, it's pure advertisement that is giving you the money. Now, that's the, the, those two things are sort of true. So mm. magazines weren't always double-dipping. Mm. Some magazines in the old days, you know, in the 50s and the 40s, they actually just sold it, to you, and there was no, no non-content in it. Really? Yeah. Traveling and, salesman. And um, in um, you know more professional kinds of magazines, you know, for very specific niche fields, you know, oh, neuro- yeah. neuroscience magazines, computer science magazines, very detailed, very high-level kinds of things. Those don't have ads as you would traditionally expect. Mm-hmm. So traditional magazines for normal people totally have ads, but in the old days they didn't necessarily have ads. And niche fields don't necessarily have ads. 
and for uh, what what did you mention movies? Yeah, movies yeah, and television. Yeah, yeah, definitely that's true. Television is an interesting case though because some channels don't have ads. So for example, the Showtime kind of channels, the HBO kind of channels, no ads, but you have to pay for them separately. Mm-hmm. So there's mm-hmm. there's that. And I was thinking of broadcast television way back right. in the 50s. And um you, you know, even even back then though, there weren't necessarily cases where there was just boatloads of ads. There would be occasional breaks where there would be some supplemental advertising, but it's not as pervasive as it is now. Mm-hmm. And in the United States, we have TV with ads, but in the UK, you pay for over-the-air broadcasting as just part of living in the country, and mm-hmm. there are no ads on mm-hmm. BBC. Hmm. You just you win. That's very I nice. Appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> so with the writing stuff, with the magazine stuff, would you consider like the difference between then journals versus a magazine? Yeah, there, there. You could think of it like that. Yeah. Okay. And now it's not it... so strict. You know, you could think of it as a journal, but there are magazines just without advertisings when the field is so much narrower. Yeah. Because they're charging fifteen dollars a copy instead of five. When you when you get far enough into a field, you start seeing like research papers being written, and yeah. those are you know the kinds of things where you either have to be associated with a university which is paying for you to access it, or you have to pay to access that that paper Mm -hmm. um yeah which is a a a short thing but very very necessary for you and you specifically maybe yeah which are oftentimes found in journals as well yeah exactly so you're willing to pay for it um and then in, in a very very few mediums we see cases where they have like membership drives so think of your local uh public radio station or or even private radio stations a lot of times they will have membership drives for the the people who religiously listen to that radio station and none of the other ones in their in their region um let's see are there are there any other mediums that would have membership drive types of things i'm sure there are but i don't know what they are Oh, I also wrote it down for television. So in the case of like PBS, you always yeah. have uh this is brought to you by so and so, so and so, the National Science Foundation mm-hmm. and viewers like you. Thank you. Very good. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't have gotten that one. Um I yeah, we watched a lot of like science related kids shows back in the day, didn't we? Bill Nye the Science Guy. Excellent. And and The Magic School Bus, I think were my two favorite shows growing up. Mhm. Uh so so that's the different mediums kind of had a, had a broad range of ways that they made money. And a lot of times uh, when, when it wasn't directly selling a copy to the, to the viewer, to the consumer, what you were doing is you were inverting. You, you wrote this down, Ryan, and I really like the way that you uh, worded it. So why don't you say it? Cause I I'm can't... glad you, why don't you say it? Cause I, I think you should, I can't find it in the text yet. That's why I can't t- tell you. Either. <laughs> <laughs> okay so it says um yeah so in the traditional okay. model uh you invert your customer so uh it, this is especially true in the case of advertising right mm-hmm. so instead of uh the the viewer the consumer being the being the customer their attention is the product that you are selling and you are selling that product to the advertisers so the right. advertisers are the real customers uh and then the the viewers are the ones who are the are are being sold mm-hmm. which is when you think of it that way it's really really dirty and i really really don't like it it's like here let me sell out the people who 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 like me mhm and th- that's where the phrase sell out comes from right mm-hmm. is you've been watching this show for a long time you really like them and then suddenly they're they're making episodes that end with like hey geico or whatever, you know, yeah. and it's like that wasn't what I what? It, it's really really off-putting. You know that they aren't saying that you should go and buy insurance from Geico because they actually believe that. They're doing that because they're being paid money and it feels inauthentic. That is that is a really big thing for audiences is this the feeling of authentic authenticity, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um so so yeah, that's that's something that that we want to avoid is putting off the audience uh, by by making it by by making them into the product that we are selling to somebody else. Um, so 
because of that, that's part of the reason why I really, really like the concept of just asking for money, of of patronage, right? Mm -hmm. Of tip jars. Um, and also of crowdfunding. That's one that we didn't mention yet is Kickstarter, right? And that that would be like the one-time drive for we're going to make this thing, we're going to make a season of whatever, we're going to we're going to come out with a board game. This is how much it'll cost. Mm -hmm. Anything after that's a bonus. Yep. What can you do? And and so it's it's yeah, like asking people to fund it once and then once that's done, you've made it, you're good to go. Yeah. Um and you don't theoretically need money for that product again. Right. Mhm. Mm whether that hopefully yeah hopefully whether <laughs> yeah. that works out necessarily is yeah uh beyond the scope of this discussion um the tip jar is something that uh actually i think we saw mostly with like web comics uh for the last 15 years you know you go you go to a site and they'll they they would have like kind of three things they would have some advertising they would have a link to Amazon where if you mm -hmm. clicked on that and went and bought something, part of that that the money that you spent at Amazon would go to the creator. Yep, as part of the referral program. Yep. And, and they would have like a, trip, a tip jar where you could like go through PayPal or whatever right. and, and give them some money. So that's like a one-time thing um, as well. And so why do you think that sort of started disappearing? Well, I can tell you that I personally don't trust PayPal. Okay, well, you're not alone, so I don't either. Uh, and I, I don't think that it's going away necessarily, but it's morphing into something else. Okay. It's, it's morphing into, because when you, when you look at, like, Patreon, you have the option of either giving a one-time mm -hmm. sum to the creator that, you're, that you are a fan of, or you can sign up to give them so, some amount of money every time that they come out with something new or like monthly or whatever. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like it's sort of a, a shift from when you pay them for their content in that case, or when you decide to pay them. So for the tip jar, you, you would pay them after you have accessed their content. Mm -hmm. Whereas as opposed to Patreon and subscription type things, you pay them before you access their content and it's, and it's, it's voluntary paying, which is why I still consider it similar. Yeah, exactly. As opposed to you have to pay in order to get it. It's just, I want to pay, give the creator of this some money to help support them. It's just a matter of when you're doing it. Mm -hmm. And most most creators, when they are putting together a Patreon, are very, very aware of kind of the dynamic there. And they make it clear that it's not necessary for everybody to go and do this. For mm -hmm. everybody to support me on Patreon. But those of you who do do it are helping to make it possible for everybody to get access to this stuff. You know, mm -hmm. those true fans. For, exactly. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's kind of stroking that good feeling mm -hmm. of, uh, I'm helping out this creator that I really like. I am a part of the creation process. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and yeah, then they'll, then they'll also quite often put pieces of that, of personalization into the Patreon, right? So, um, if you, if you, for example, if you go and support SciShow on Patreon, uh, you will be able to submit questions to them for them to answer possibly yeah. in future episodes, right? And I think that's a great model for doing that. Okay. Yeah. That, I'm, that's fair game. Um, see, so... When I first mentioned Patreon to you a long time ago, Ryan, you were very, very poo-poo on it. I uh, maybe we shouldn't put this right here, but uh, I don't know. We can talk okay. about wherever you want. Well, I'm yeah, I'm curious to know because I I figured that like the that personalization would be something that you might not be a fan of. So I'm okay with that because it's still going back into the mainstream of the audience. Mm -hmm. So, for, you know, if if a person is paying to get their questions answered, that's cool. That means their questions probably really good because they had to pay for it. Okay. Um, so what, which, which, which aspect of Patreon are, do you, are you uncomfortable with? So there's, there's probably a couple things. So first, I don't like anything that's monthly and I'm not going to ask anybody, to, anybody ever to do something for me monthly. That's just, right. You're a fan of the yearly. That's just disgusting to me. If you can't figure out how to handle a year of financial gravity, then you shouldn't be doing it. Mm. Mm. And for me, it's much easier for me to conceptually reason a one-time thing than something that sucks the life out of me continuously. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's that. And I also don't like rewards that are tiered like, okay, so you didn't pay $15. 
So you get the ten dollar reward, and you're locked out of whatever that fifteen dollar reward is mm-hmm. forever. You never even get to hear about it. You don't get to see it. You don't get access to our Slack channel. Blah blah blah. I don't like that. I want everybody to have whatever I can make and enjoy everything at the same time. Mm. So is the, is the timed release something that you're okay with? So giving things to the patrons before it's it's released to the yeah, general public. Yeah, I'd be okay with that as long as it's reasonable. I don't see a problem. Okay. Uh, let's see. There's probably one other thing. So the other thing I don't like is just in general gating. So if you had special things for patrons only, don't like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that that that's generally my issue with that. I think that those are all very reasonable points. Oh, I'm glad think, everybody yeah. thinks so. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Good. Um. Now the the problem with this is that it still doesn't it doesn't help with the findability issue no that's something that is you're going to have to worry about um before and and frankly the patronage model isn't going to work for you if you haven't already been found by people Mm -hmm. true so that's yeah turns out (laughs) and so there's a lot of different aspects of findability i don't really even like the word findability or discoverability don't like those things it's really just all a case of popularity. There are only so, there's only so much time. And there's only so many people who are in our niche here for podcasting. There's only so much a person is able to find and then care about the same topic over and over again. So I've been on various shows, the gaming show. I've been on the gadget show. I've been on uh, the Apple show. And all these shows have already been done somewhere else. And so it's not even just about being found. It's about being unique enough in a niche that's not being catered to or being personable enough or being unique enough as a person, not even as a topic, to be listened to or watched or consumed. Mm -hmm. Mm. So all of that's really complicated. And it's not something that you can just magically do. Yeah. 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 And it's that intangible thing about is your personality a good one for for the thing that you're doing, right? Well, I know I have the face to radio. So. Exactly. I love using that phrase, <laughs> and people kind of look at me funny. Usually, because oh. usually because I like I I use the phrase uh, I have the face for podcasting, and then they kind of look at me like, why the heck are you talking about podcasting? I always listen to you funny because it's podcast. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> we can't watch a podcast. Right. You listen to a yes. podcast. Yes. I listen to you funny. All righty. Okay. Hi, funny. I'm Ian. So, so I think I think let, we're ready to talk specifically about the music and yeah. our artisanal stuff that you wanted to talk about, Ian. Yeah. So a lot of what we've been talking about, it feels like, have been goals to try and make. So these are different ways that you can try and get yourself out there with immediacy, personalization, interpretation, authenticity. So these are the those are the things that you can do to help make yourself um desirable Mm -hmm. and then the 1000 true fans that's sort of a goal that we went towards and then the other ones were just sort of ideas that you can go through depending on which media that you were going for so this is the the specific thing that i want to talk about are some different ways to build yourself up as an artist and then to get yourself out there on necessarily or well in ways that aren't necessarily just reliant on information Mm -hmm. in terms of like internet stuff right um so i mean the first thing that you want to do is build up a portfolio. Um, So a portfolio is just a list of your works, a place where people can go and view what you've done. So whether that be music, that could be things like a set list, or if you do have a website, you can make a bunch of recordings and put it up on there and say, here, here's some of the stuff that I've done. I hope you do that. And uh, something that I really, really like is uh, the Creative Commons licenses. So whenever I make something, I almost always release it under a Creative Commons attribution license so that anybody else can take what I've done, rework it, remix it, make it, you know, incorporate it into their own work as well, uh, as long as I get credit for being, you know, my stuff being a part of that. That's so interesting. And so that's yeah. that's kind of a way to both give to the community and allow other people to um, access this stuff and, and and be able to make their stuff better mm-hmm. using my stuff. Hey, by the way, thanks uh for for the um yes. the, the the theme song for this uh you know um podcast there's that a theme was, song for this i well it was made by somebody else who we went and grabbed their thing via I thought that was know, second a, opinion oh you're right yes but i mean we do have we do, we have some sort of theme song for this show that yeah, it, it was released under creative commons by somebody else because we're not musicians can't tell you if that's true or not the two of us are not musicians <laughs> i was about to say <laughs> <laughs> that's um, true so it's interesting that you like creative commons so much so i i don't make 
audio or uh, you know pictures very frequently. But if I make something, it's usually code. And I always put that under MIT mm-hmm. specifically because I do not want attribution. I do not want anything. Mm. Like I am uh, uh, pure as I can be in my licensing. Well, and there is Creative Commons like absolutely no rights reserved. I want reserved. as minimal license as I want. And I, you know, Creative Commons is, feels good, but it feels almost too heavy for me. It's a undue burden. Okay. And I just don't want to be a part of it. Of course, um, I mean, people have heard of Creative Commons, right? So when you... When I you, hope so. When you go and release something and they are looking specifically for stuff that has been released under Creative Commons, they're going to find it. Whereas somebody who goes and sees your thing and it's marked as being being released under MIT, they're going to be like, okay, what does that mean? Now I have to go and look well, it up. Well, so if, I'm, if I were releasing music, for example, it would just be public domain, just marked. Public oh, sure, domain. sure. <laughs> so, I mean, for me, MIT equals public domain. It's not, but, you know, technically it isn't, but it's close enough. Okay, gotcha. As you were. As I was. Um, so build up a portfolio so that people can see what you do, the sort of things that you do. Then network. Network, as I said, I cannot stress this one enough, network, because the people who you know um, will oftentimes be the ones who, especially if you have personal interactions with them, will be the ones who will be most likely to consume your product, mm-hmm. um, as well as they can pass that on to other people, even if that wasn't necessarily their thing itself. So as well as they can say what? Oh, um, as well as, um, oh crap, I forgot where I was going with that. Thanks, Ryan. (laughs) Anytime. People who you know are more likely to, who you've personally interacted with are more likely to To consume the thing that you did? Yeah. And, and pass on your product as well as, um, get you more opportunities to, to, to show off your product. So I know just being in the Twin Cities, uh, as a musician, I've been asked to be in several different groups here and there and here and there. And that wasn't necessarily me going out and finding groups. That was people who I know who sucked me into those groups, who gave me more opportunities to to distribute my abilities and my art. Mm-hmm. And part of that is because it's just because you're so good. That's true. Oh, that's true. Just saying. Now, you know, I have a question. Answer. Does it count if you put a bunch of your business cards into high school textbooks while you're working at the library. I would simply call that distribution, not networking, because you're not necessarily making a personal connection where you can be drawn into something. You're, not, you're saying, this is who I am. This is a thing. Keep it in mind. Mm-hmm. I'll tell you more in the French later about that. Long story short, Ryan did that when he was in high school. <laughs> oh, but it's even more insidious than you even know. Oh, man. God. But that does actually leave for a good segue to the next point, which was get yourself out there. Um, so as a performing artist, we had talked about showrooms, or not as a performing artist, sorry, as a visual artist. At, so um, get yourself out at showrooms, get yourself out at art festivals, maybe have a bunch of photographs that you can, that would be part of your portfolio that people can go and see to sample your work. Um, as, a, as a performing artist, obviously go out and perform. Get let people know what you do, how you do it, and let them see what you can do. And I mean, if you can find some sort of agent or someone who's able to help you via your trade or say, "Hey, I want to help you with this," then that's also important. But essentially, the the, the thing is, sorry, the thing is, is that people, if they don't know what product you have, they're not going to have any incentive to buy it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, there's also different steps and different ways that you can go out and canvas. So like when you're first starting out, finding ways to get yourself more distributable is really important. So that can be things from like free samples or more of those photographs. Or um, if you have like a a YouTube account or a SoundCloud account, distribute links. Mm-hmm. Um, but just ways for people to find that you're what you're doing. And I mean, it's still good to go and put more of your stuff out there on those channels. But once you establish that fan base, then you can start making stuff specifically for you. Um, I would also say it's, it's important to know who you are making the piece for and also to let, let your audience know what, what you're making and why you're making it Mm -hmm. specifically. Um, so like an example of this was a piece that I played uh, in college was called Karel Husa's um, Prague 1968 or music for Prague 1968 it is in all essence it, 
a terrifying piece because it was written about um, the Soviet army coming in and squashing, um, I guess, a wave of liberalism that was sweeping Prague. I remember you telling me about this, yeah. And if I if I didn't know that, the piece would have just sounded like noise to me. It's just like, why why am I listening to this? And you can try and guess w- what they may be getting at, but as soon as you find out the reason behind it, you find ways to connect to it personally. You find ways to empathize. You find ways to sympathize. So as a consumer, that can oftentimes lead to a more powerful impact, which is oftentimes the point of art <laughs> overall. But... If you make things, make them for a reason and then make that reason well known. Um, if you have, if you're just trying to do it for profit, then you also will oftentimes have to bite the bullet and suck in your pride and go for more what the audience wants. I, what you said about, uh, having a story behind it is actually, yeah, really, really important. I recently read a medium post about a guy who, uh, he made an app for, for iOS, like took him, you know, one night to do it. He released it, didn't do any advertising or anything. And the whole thing was kind of this, this experiment to see what parts of moving the project forward brought more of an audience, brought more revenue. Right. And the thing that, that made it go big was the fact that eventually word got out that he was doing this just as an experiment, mm-hmm. right? So the story behind the app, rather than the app itself, was what made it succeed mm-hmm. financially. So it's a personal thing. It's an event. It's a phenomenon. And then, yeah, when you have those stories, it transports the consumer to that mm-hmm. and helps them be a part of it. Um, but again, so if you're making if you're making stuff not necessarily for reasons like that, the, the if it's just strictly for money, then you'll have to bite the bullet oftentimes and and create stuff that some people wouldn't consider art. But it's also, as I had previously said, in my opinion, it can also be a really cool opportunity to stretch your edges and find some un some unknown discoveries. Because then you'll you'll if you put restrictions on yourself, you have to think within those restrictions. And you can either make it a box or you can make it just a top and a bottom and find ways to stretch sideways. Um, so my, my, my encouragement would be don't view restrictions as necessarily a bad thing. Think of them as way to expand or ways to expand. Same thing with criticism. Criticism is, is huge. And I mean, the stuff that you make, not everyone is going to like that's, that's just the way that it is. Yeah. We all have different tastes, but you can still find a lot of wisdom in people who want to go and look and a lot of people who maybe have some more experience than you, but it's also really, really hard. And this is the trick is finding a way to discern people just being assholes from people who are actually trying to give you constructive criticism. Yeah. There's the people who are only positive in their feedback. That's useless. Yep. The people who are only negative. That's useless. Sometimes it's the people who are giving you a nuanced critique of you know telling you yes what went well what didn't those are the ones that you really want to pay attention to because mm-hmm. they've put some thought into it they hopefully know what they're talking about a little bit yeah uh, and but you know you have to take that into account while you are evaluating their feedback their criticism yeah so basically constantly ask why yeah though that's always a a good motto in life is always ask why And you can always look at where you're getting that criticism from. You know, if it's from Twitch chat, just ignore it. (laughs) If it's from iTunes, you know, maybe put a little bit more reputation into it. But if it's somebody coming to you on the Twitter and they're suggesting something or they have a thought, you know, it's probably something useful because they're actually bothering to reach out actively. And it's not even just a pass review like on iTunes. It's something going directly to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And the hope that is eventually after you get all this, you will establish a reputation of having a good product. And I mean, that's, that's sort of the end goal, the end stage. So the reputation comes with the thousand, thousand true fans. Um, think establishing a name brand. How many people buy Apple things just because they're Apple things? Yeah. Yeah. So Ryan's shaking his head in disappointment. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you, you establish a reputation of having quality pieces as well as what sort of niches that you fill. Mm-hmm. And that way people can know, hey, this person fills this particular niche in my life. I should go to them to go and try and fill that niche. And it's pretty easy when you're trying to fill a niche to sound pretentious. 
Sometimes. You just gotta say, you know, for for people who are not into that, the you know, you're going to sound pretty pretty uppity. I think sometimes. Yeah. 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 When I hear uh, Decker here talk about music stuff, I just love to hear him talk about music stuff because I don't know anything about it, but it sounds like he knows what he's talking about. I don't <laughs> think of him as being pretentious. Well, but when I talk about something. I know I'm being pretentious because I have no clue what I'm talking about, but it sounds like I do. <laughs> Pull, pulling back the curtain a little there. Oh, man. <laughs> I can show you the drapes behind the curtains. Okay. Are yeah. you the great and powerful Oz? Sure. I don't know. He doesn't watch TV. TV. He's the great and powerful Paul. Paul so, Horn. Oh, yeah. Okay. We'll go with that. Speaking of which, I, I did make a Medium account for Paul Horn to test oh. out publications <laughs> and That's stuff. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Um, so for... Conclusions that I've come to based on all of this this research and, and stuff that I've done um, for for the kinds of things that I do um, almost all of the things that I do are are things that are going to be released digitally um, and especially recently I got into photography now that I have a real camera mm-hmm. and uh, obviously I'm still learning a lot about it and and I haven't put a lot of I haven't had time to to put forth the effort to make a lot of money at it right yeah. Um, so, so what I, the conclusion that I've come to, and this, it may change over time, is release pretty much all of the, the pictures that I do, uh, other than like, you know, family photos from, from family events and stuff like that. Um, the, the photos that I actually go out and intentionally take for the purpose of photography, um, release those Creative Commons, uh, online. And then if people want to like get prints of them, I'll sell them prints. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. For a heck of a lot more than the prints are going to cost me to actually get printed off, right. but that's you know that's part of it, right? Is is it's the embodiment? <laughs> They're paying for the embodiment of that picture, right? In the mm-hmm. specific size and and uh, quality, you know, the the, the type of, of uh, paper that is printed on, you know. Right. So mm-hmm. it's it's going to be a different embodiment than if they are looking at it on their phone, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and then also, uh, you know, take take commissions, right? Of hey. I want you to come and be the photographer at my wedding. I want you to go out with me to downtown St. Paul and do a photo shoot with mm-hmm. like the pretty skyline in the background. So that would be personalization. Right. Um, so that the, the, the main works that I'm doing are being released online for free for everybody to, to view. Um, and that is being funded by the other aspects of it. The more specific ones that can't be easily distributed for free. Um, and all that free stuff that you have up there already is sort of your own advertising, first party advertising for yep. yourself with the the portfolio part yes. of it. Yep. Um, and and yeah, and and you have to kind of kind of give. You have to make sure that you're giving the audience um, the opportunity to support you you financially if they want to. So uh, alongside pretty much everything that I ever make, I'm going to have a link to a Patreon so that people, if they wish to. You know, it's not required or anything, um, but, you know, make it easy for people to contribute financially to the project if they want to. Um, and then obviously, uh, as a creator, you have to be available to interact with people, um, especially via social media online. Mm-hmm. Um, when you're when you're making things online, you got to be available online. And then that never used to be a thing. But in the last 10 years, it's now a thing. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. if you're still using html4 you might not know about this thing called twitter uh big week there's something called twitter go and use it Mm -hmm. what turns out and i don't think i don't think that any of us have gotten to the the point the level where we can realistically do merchandising no as as a uh, as a as a uh, revenue stream because that requires a larger audience size um you asking for money you can do at any time whether there are people there or not if there are no people there you just won't get money no mm-hmm. problem uh but you don't want to go out and get t-shirts printed with the nexus logo and with big week huge and you know uh, <laughs> well i wouldn't want to do that for other reasons too <laughs> <laughs> i mean part of the appeal of merchandise is that if you you're walking around sort of as a self-advertisement both for what what you, what's on the shirt as well as for yourself saying this is something that I enjoy. So you're able mm-hmm. to help connect with more people who enjoy that. Yeah. So speaking of merchandising, I'm totally wearing a, uh, don't forget to be awesome t-shirt right now from Hank and John. I mean, <laughs> uh, that's, that's, that's pretty good. Slight nod. I, I bought it at uh, NerdCon stories, uh-huh. which was, uh, you know, the embodiment of, of 
being able to see all of these cool people that I'm a fan of in, yeah. in the flesh. Yeah. Also, one other thing that I forgot to mention, and this is not something that's completely necessary, but if you are a creator, I would suggest that you go out and find a way to teach whatever you're creating as well. Mm. Um, in part because in order to be a good teacher, you have to master the subject enough to the point where you can break it down into steps for someone who is completely new to learn. So, I mean, you have to have the basics down, but you also have to have the specifics down enough that you can break them down and relate them to the other basics. Um, it also helps with establishing you as a reputation or establishing your reputation as well as getting your works out there. Mm -hmm. So, again, it's not a necessary thing, but I would recommend finding ways to teach whatever you do. And I like that um, that you mentioned that because a as somebody who's a high school teacher now... Um, I'm I'm not only teaching like the the podcasting stuff and and a bit of the photography stuff and everything uh but I'm also using the podcasts here as a way to record semi lessons, right? Mm -hmm. So if there's a subject that I that I want the students to learn about, I can totally just come over here record a, an, an extra dimension episode about that subject and then make it be required listening for for the students. Yeah. So the reason that this episode exists is because as as I've been thinking especially about all of these things about about how creators can support themselves um I I started thinking about yeah all of the different creative hobbies that I have and and a huge one uh, of course is podcasting um for the three years that we were doing this during college, it ate up a huge amount of my time yeah. uh, and effort. And, and uh, let's be honest, I almost failed a few classes sophomore year when we first started this because I was uh, getting in over my head. Yeah. Could happen. Don't do that. Yeah, no. Um, so we, we dialed it back quite a bit, right? Um, got got a, a steady job that's actually paying the bills. Mm -hmm. But like the dream is, what if, what if I could take this podcasting thing <laughs> and make it into something that at, at least isn't a, a, just a drag on, on mm -hmm. my energy and time and doesn't give anything back, right? right. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not expecting it, it, us to go, co go big enough to like make this into our full-time jobs. Um, and I'm not sure I would want that, actually. Mm -hmm. It'd be yeah. cool, but I, yeah, I, I'm not sure that that would be a desire. But at least make this hobby into something that I, I don't have to go like, oh, I, okay, I'm, I'm preparing for the podcast and I'm having to give up all of these other things that right. I could be doing with my life, right? Yeah. Um, so here, here's the question. People who are listening to this, go and click on that contact form on the, on the show notes. So go to thenexus.tv slash TED8. If you're on a desktop, look on the right-hand side of the page. If you're on mobile, scroll down. Yep. You'll see our three pictures, pictures of the three of us. And underneath that, you will see contact. And so click on that and go and type in some stuff and tell us, you know, are we crazy? Would you be willing to support us financially? Um, you know, what what do you think of, of the stuff that we are talking about here? Do you exist? Are there people listening? Are the download numbers that we see just fake stuff from Google? I don't know. You know, we, we, we would love to know that kind of thing before we decided whether or not we wanted to actually put together um, Patreons for or, or you In know, a variety of things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For for our shows. Right. Yeah. You know, if you recall years ago, the uh, first year survey. Do you, do you remember oh, this? I do remember back, that. Back in the long days ago. And what I determined from that survey is that nobody was there. Yeah, some, well, some people did click it, and some people did fill it out. Some people filled it up maliciously, <laughs> and you know that's what happens. And so I think it's a, a, a good thing to ask occasionally to see if anybody's there. Mm -hmm. hmm. And it, it, to be fair, there were a, a number of people who filled it out. Oh yeah, but. Even though there were, weren't any names attached to it, I was able to go through and look and identify exactly who each of those people That's were. That's not a good sign. So, well, yeah, yeah no. It, I mean, we were appealing to our friends, right? Mm -hmm. With um, at least back then. Let's see. And uh, also, fun story: there is uh, a a submission to that survey from uh, September twenty fifth, two thousand and fourteen. Set. The wrong year? Yes, that that's okay. a full two years after the first year survey. <laughs> it was me, and I and I did that 
as a test to see if you were ever going to look at the, the results of that survey ever again. And nope. the answer is no. Nope. That was the first year survey only. I don't think I can even find that in my drive. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yep. So you know how we end all of these kind of shows? With talking about where you can find us on the internet. Right. So where can we oh, find well, you? Before, all? before oh. that, actually, okay. since this is the extra dimension, the variety show, the uh, we can have episodes about whatever topics we want. Um, if you, the listener, have any suggestions for us for subjects that we should tackle, or if you want to come on the show and uh, you know tackle a subject with us. Get in contact with us. Use that contact contact form that we were talking about earlier, or Twitter, whatever yep. you want. Mm-hmm. Just just you know, reach out. So speaking of Twitter, Ryan, where can we find you? Well, you can find me just about everywhere, but especially on the Twitter at Ryan Mar, and of course on the Google Plus, which is where I post pictures of things like cats, for example. And as for me, uh, Ian Buck, you can find me uh, as Ian R Buck on uh, yeah Twitter and on Flickr and. Uh, various other places where I post the things that I make. Medium, that's where my writing is posted. Uh, and here on the Nexus. Yeah. I should really start up a YouTube channel for all the music stuff that I do. Mm-hmm. I, you already have a music or a YouTube channel. I should actually use that for music stuff on my YouTube channel. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm Ian Decker. You can find me on Twitter at Bigfoot1138. I also need to consolidate all of my usernames. Um, Steam is Bigfoot. I don't know. Facebook wherever <laughs> I know well, I'm not what, helpful. What's your middle initial? A. Okay. Yep. And actually on Facebook he has the entire middle name okay. written out, Alexander. Yes. But yeah. So I need to consolidate my 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 internet presence. That, that's one thing that I've noticed about the difference between you and I is that you are very good at the networking in person and uh but you you don't pay very much attention to any of your social media accounts you know i've i've tweeted several things that involve uh, ian decker you know because i'm mentioning that he was in the podcast episode or whatever um you know he doesn't see that because he doesn't log into twitter so it's fine yeah i i can get that on my phone you can yes yeah weird how that works so maybe maybe you and i just balance each other out sure epic handhold epic handhold and with that have a good one see you later